Sweet promises given to all who believe. Welcome to Bible Talk class again. We are looking at the third phase of biblical hermeneutics in history. And this third phase, we are going to look at the authority, inspiration, and language. And our presentation will be done in two parts. The first part focuses on the inspiration and authority of Scripture, the authority of the Bible. The second part consists of an introduction to textual criticism, translation, and hermeneutics. Let's begin with the first part, the inspiration and authority of Scripture. Definition of terms. We need to understand these terms before we uh, delve into the uh, question of inspiration and authority of Scripture. Revelation. Revelation refers to God's un unveiling of His character through words and deeds in history. So God revealed Himself uh, through words and deeds or His acts in history. An inspiration is a process God used to communicate his message through his written word. So we are looking at the process that God used to communicate his word, his written word, to us as inspiration. Illumination is an experience in which spiritual discernment of scripture is provided by the Holy Spirit. So when, when one studies the text and one sees some insights um, in the text, one can say that um, uh, one has been uh, illumined by the Spirit to understand the test. Now let's look at um, different theories about the nature of inspiration, since our topic is inspiration. The first view, or this first theory, is the illumination view of inspiration. This view holds that scripture contains the uplifting messages of great people of faith, such as Noah, David, and Daniel, and so on. These messages may be inspirational to the reader, but the biblical authors who compile these messages are not divinely inspired. In other words, the words of David, the words of Solomon, the words of Abraham are inspirational, very inspiring, very moving. But the author, let's say Moses, who put these words together, or Luke, who put these words together, or recorded the historical account, Luke was not divinely inspired. He was only a collector. Let's evaluate this view. This view emphasized the human element in Scripture in that it highlights the diversity of Scripture. This view appeals to those who view supernatural inspiration as offensive to the progressive minds. So if you don't want to offend people who don't believe in God, then you can see scripture as humanly uh, inspired. In other words, the words and the thoughts of humans written in scripture are inspirational and that there was no divine involvement in the writing or in the uh, happenings of the events that are recorded in Scripture. So, the downside of this um, view is that this view naturally renders Scripture as lacking authority if there are many voices. If we see just the human thoughts to be inspirational, um, then we have a little problem. And so that is a problem with this view. The next view is called the detection view of inspiration. This view holds that scripture is the divine word of God with human beings only instruments through whom God spoke his messages. And so here, there's little or no human element in the process. Scripture is perfect and with no errors. This is what this view teaches. In short, God spoke and human beings only wrote down what God asked them to write down. So that's detection view. So God detected the words, and the human beings put the words down. So the human beings were just like uh, uh, stenographers. This view emphasizes 
divine authorship because God is the author of every word of scripture. So that's the positive side of this view. Very interesting. However, if God used human beings as only secretaries, why do we have different vocabularies and styles in the books of the Bible? Different authors, different vocabularies, um, different styles. And so if God was the one who detected every word, then we shouldn't have this problem uh, or shouldn't have any differences. Also, some of the stories are told twice if God was responsible for detecting every word as he wanted it to be written. And so if God was the one detecting, then um, he should have known that um, he was repeating himself. The third view is the dynamic view of inspiration. This view teaches that God inspired the thoughts of the authors, not the very worst use. And so that is dynamic view. Dynamic view is thought inspiration. The good side of this view is that this view recognizes the concerted effort of both divinity and humanity to communicate God's message. This means that errors in scripture will be attributed to human limitation. And so, because God only inspired, only, you know, breathed into the thought, into the minds of human beings, he allowed human beings to write, and therefore, um, both God and human work together to produce the Bible that we have today. And that if there are errors in scripture, we should blame human limitation, not uh, God. That is the positive side of, of this view, as some scholars have um, asserted. However, this view has been understood as subscribing to double authorities in Scripture, inconsistent biblical authority. In other words, there are parts that you can say, this is God, this is human, and uh, the problem is human, and that the human is in charge, or God is in charge, you know, so we have a little problem with authority as to who has the final voice. Is it God or human? So that is the problem with this view that some have identified. The next one is called the plenary verbal view of inspiration. It holds that God allowed human beings to use their own language, but he supervised them to use the very words that he wanted them to use in writing down his message. This is very interesting. So God only supervised. He allowed them, but he supervised them to use the that was that he intended them to use. This view maintains a high view of biblical authority while allowing human element or active uh, involvement. The, 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 the negative or, you know, uh, the downside of this view is that a clear explanation as to how God supervised the choice of words for the authors remains a mystery. How God did the supervision, nobody is able to tell uh, us today. The last view is a multi-methodological approach to inspiration. What this view teaches is that um, the Bible consists of different um, genres. And because of these uh, you know, genres, one should expect that God uh, should use different uh, processes of inspiration to communicate his will or communicate his, you know, his mind. And so that's what we mean by multi-methodological approach to inspiration. And therefore, according to this view, the narrative part or portion of the Bible or the historical part um, was inspired by God and God allowed the authors to use their own words and that God was the subject of the events that were recorded, the narrative, the historical parts of the Bible. The second one is the Torah, the law. And according to this view, God, you know, detected the, the, the words that um, had to be written. And so detection view uh, works with uh, the Torah or the, the, the law. The prophetic words, according to this uh, view, uh, when it comes to prophetic words, the inspiration, um, you know, uh, process uh, happened in a way that God 
only gave his word, verbal message. So the, 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 the prophet received the verbal message and then they recorded it. So that is a verbal uh, inspiration. The apocalyptic text, no, no, Daniel Revelation, uh, because they saw visions, um, the author's you know, minds or thoughts were filled with divine revelation, divine uh, visions. And so we go by inspiration of thoughts because their minds, their eyes saw, and once their eyes saw, whatever they saw was registered in their minds and therefore they wrote in their own words. So we go by inspiration of thought for apocalyptic texts. Wisdom literature or wisdom texts, we are looking at Psalms, we are looking at uh, uh, Solomon and um, Solomon's uh, Proverbs and other uh, you know, wisdom uh, texts. And so here, inspiration of thought, because it was God who gave the wisdom to Solomon and, and the rest. Uh, Psalms in particular, uh, inspiration of experience and the author's word. So here, how the author experienced, like David experienced God's faithfulness, kindness. Uh, that experience moved him to chronicle all his experiences with God. And so we also see that one as more or less inspiration of thought based on a personal experience of God. Now, evaluation of this view is, is interesting. The good side is that this view appears to recognize diverse processes by which God communicates his message while involving human beings in the process. So you can see God and human you know, working together to communicate you know, the word of God or God's word um, and using different approaches because you have different kinds of literature. Now, the problem with this view, as some have pointed out, is the question of biblical authority has been considered by the advocates of single process views as the major flaw of a multi methodological approach view of inspiration. So, if you have different genre, you have the legal test, you have historical narrative test, you have prophetic test, and you have different processes, then the question is that uh, what is the authority? Um, who I mean, who, who has authority here? Is it God or the human being? You know, for example, the way uh, God detected his word when he wanted Moses to write the, the law, uh, it's not the same way that you find, uh, you know, in, in, in narrative texts. And so who has authority? Is it the historian who is gathering the, the data or, 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 or God? You know, what, what, what is the issue here? So that is the problem that some have. Uh, pointed out. In other words, this method is not uh, uh, good enough. That's a, that's a point uh, you know, some scholars are making. I have a proposal to make about inspiration. And at, at the end of the day, I want to affirm the multi-methodological approach to inspiration in a different way. First, I want to establish that the Holy Scriptures were written by many authors in different cultures from ours. Events recorded by these authors are the true reflections of God's dealings with his creations. There are many voices heard in the Scriptures, yet God's handiworks with respect to creation and restoration are imprinted on each page of his word. There's a purpose why God allowed his dealings with human beings to be recorded for us. The scriptures do not silence the innocent misconceptions, competing opinions of God. Rather, they are allowed in the print to further register creatures' limited appreciation of divinity. This is the voice of God. This is the word of God. God has allowed several opinions about him, misconceptions about him, and even competing opinions about him to be recorded. For us to learn that anytime God interacts with human beings and they do not allow him to reveal his true identity to them, they begin to say all sorts of things about him. They begin to assume many things about him. And when God allowed all those things to remain in his word, it doesn't mean that the word is faulty. It means that God is perfect. He allows us to see the imperfection. And out of that, we see his perfection because he comes out to tell us 
exactly what he is thinking, exactly what he wants to do, his word. So the voice of God is always true and stands out all the time. And so the word of God, as we see here in scripture, is a word that reveals a complete picture of events that happened in the past in which God demonstrated his true will, his true identity as he related to human beings and other creatures in the past. Now, interpreting or let's say interpreting um, any genre, we must appreciate the form of inspiration. And that is what multi methodological uh, approach to inspiration has actually laid out. But I just want to stress that when it comes to legal tests, as I've already mentioned, in the Old Testament, God penned his own rules or laws for Israel and instructed and supervised Moses to write certain sayings for Israel. When it comes to the law, the laws were divine self penned inspiration. That is the form of inspiration or the process that took place. When it comes to, when it comes to narrative tests, the contents of these stories are divinely driven written, done by godly human beings, guided by God's spirit in the selection of the information needed for the immediate and the remote audience, hence inspiration of thought. So narrative tests, historical tests, the process is thought inspiration. The songs and the proverbs were inspired by the wisdom and the humble experience of God by godly human authors, hence inspiration of thought. So when you read 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 to 34, you see that God was the one who gave Solomon the wisdom to be able to write these songs, proverbs, uh, and the like. Prophetic and apocalyptic texts. This, here we see that certain human beings spoke the words as given by God with the formula, thus says the Lord, or thus says the Lord, hence thought inspiration. So they receive um, a word, sometimes they could hear, sometimes they could see the visions, and whatever they saw or heard registered in their minds, and therefore they wrote. So the process is um, thought inspiration. Epistolary test. The authors being born servants of God responded to issues with the gift of the wisdom of God, hence inspiration of thought. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, God gave um, Paul, wisdom to address issues. And so one can say that the letters that were written in the New Testament in particular, um, those authors of, these, of, of the letters had the wisdom of God. God endowed them with his wisdom to address uh, issues that uh, were posed to them. And therefore, it's inspiration of thought process. The inerrancy of scripture. Inerrancy is defined as being free from all falsehood or deceit. There are five views on the meaning of biblical inerrancy. One, propositional inerrancy. This affirms that every sentence in the Bible is considered as a true proposition because of verbal inspiration. Two, pateistic inerrancy. This is the simple trust that all statements in the Bible are true. Nuance inerrancy. This describes inerrancy of scripture as depending on the genres of the Bible. In other words, there are no errors in scripture if you look at the kind of writing. If you look at the, the historical books, look at only the historical books. Don't compare them with um, uh, the prophetic books. So just look at only historical books. If you look at the historical books or legal texts, you see that there are no errors. The critical inerrancy focuses on each author's purpose of writing. So some are saying that if you look at each author, you will not find any error in the author's books because each author is independent. Don't compare two authors. If you compare two authors, definitely you see errors. But if you look at each author, you will not find any error. So that's critical inerrancy. The functional inerrancy views the Bible as inerrant in matters of faith, 
or ethics, but not necessarily science and history. So some are saying that, well, when it comes to faith and, uh, you know, morality, uh, well, there are no errors in scripture. But, talk about science and history, there are errors. So, these are the five views of um, inerrancy of scripture. And inerrancy simply means no errors in scripture. Now, argument against the doctrine of inerrancy. Some feel that there are errors in scripture. Why? Because of the autograph problem. Autograph problem is that we do not have the original copies of what the authors wrote. So, because we have copies of copies of copies of the originals, because originals are not here. We have only copies of copies. And so, definitely, you must have errors. Um, number two is that there are apparent discrepancies in the Bible. And that there are discrepancies. There are some differences, you know, in the Bible, especially where you have two books talking about the same thing and they seem to have some uh, differences. And so, there are, there are errors in Scripture. So, this is the argument that some are making. And here there's evidence that uh, they, they put forth. Second Samuel chapter 10, verse 18, and First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 18. The next one is the, the human factor in the inspiration process, which may lead to error. Fine, God inspired them. Um, but they were, they, they, they were human beings, and therefore they could have made mistakes. So the human factor should not be uh, you know, removed from this uh, equation. The last thing is that the Bible is infallible and trustworthy. So those who say that there are errors in Scripture argue that we should see the Bible as trustworthy but not without error. And there are those who argue for the doctrine of inerrancy. In other words, there are no errors in Scripture. Why? Because, number one, God's character. God's character is perfect. There's no error. Number two, it's a logical argument. That is, the major premise is that, or premise is that God does not err. If God does not err, and the Bible is God's word, therefore the Bible does not err. That's the argument that they make. The third argument is that Scripture affirms the doctrine of inerrancy as Jesus said. Jesus said that none of the law, okay, written will uh, collapse. Everything will fulfill and that everything is fine. Therefore, there are no errors in Scripture. And also historical affirmation of denial of inerrancy and spirituality. Some are saying that, uh, you know, according to this view, they are saying that um, those who uh, taught uh, that there were errors in Scripture later on left the church. And therefore, it is not a good thought even to have about uh, you know, uh, you know, saying that uh, there are errors in Scripture. Don't say that. If you say that, um, you might leave the church or lose your salvation. And the errors and eternal salvation. So this argument is saying that if there are errors in Scripture, definitely you cannot have eternal salvation because the Bible teaches about salvation. And if there are errors in the Bible, then you don't have eternal salvation. So stop talking about errors in Scripture, according to those who argue for um, the doctrine of, in, of in, inerrancy. Now we look at the authority of the Bible. Does the Bible have authority? We have two ways to establish this. One is the internal evidence. This includes Bible's claim of its authority as given by God. Because God was the one who gave the word. So the Bible has authority, the words. Christ recognizing the OT as authoritative. So Christ recognized the Old Testament as authoritative. This is the word of God. So it's authoritative. It means that... Um, it's binding. It means that I must obey the words in the Bible. That's why the Bible has authority or is authoritative. Now, the unity of the Bible signifies also divine authority. How all the sister, uh, six books put together, um, you know, speaking the same voice. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And that shows that there's authority. The external evidence includes the Bible's life, changing effect on people, its remarkable survival, its confirmation in the findings of archaeology, and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. 
So externally, outside the Bible, we see that the Bible changes human life. And it has survived several revolts and several attempts to, you know, uh, extinguish it. And also, it has been confirmed that the statement, the events in the Bible have been confirmed in archaeological findings. And the inner witness of the Holy Spirit in a, every believer tells us that indeed the words in the Bible are authoritative and are reliable. Now, the authority of the Bible means that it is entirely trustworthy in all matters, it is approached with hermeneutics of affirmation, its ultimate author is God, the application of grammatical historical method is carefully done and uses historical critical approach with great care. The modern scientific uh, standards should not be imposed on biblical data as the only model of truth, and that attempt should be made to address discrepancies and accept our human limitation if cannot be addressed. 7. The Bible should be viewed as both divine human production. So that's what we mean by authority of the Bible. Now let's look at authority of the Bible proper. What we just did is only to back up a case for uh, inspiration and the uh, relevance in our time. Now we want to look at it from the time of Jesus and then up to our time. So Jesus' authority and scripture. The authority of Jesus is the miracle stories. The miracles that Jesus performed showed his power and where he came from. His teaching shows his authority. He had command over what he was teaching and his appeal to the Old Testament as authority. So he also recognized the Old Testament as authority, authoritative. Now, we look at origin, we look at the church history. Origin saw authority invested not in church officers, but those who discern mystical truths, those who could see uh, spiritual truth when you know reading the Bible, uh, were the ones that had authority. The Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent regarded the church as the authority that should interpret scripture. The Reformation era projected a high view of scripture as inherently authoritative. And Protestant scholasticism made doctrines as authority rather than scripture. The Enlightenment period considered the uh, autonomous reason the authority. It was during this period that historical critical methods emerged. This method used hermeneutics of suspicion, whereas grammatical historical method uses the hermeneutics of affirmation. Now, I have a proposal for you, and that is authority rests in scripture and is communicated in the mission of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, our guide, and the church. The scripture is here to achieve an eternal goal of reconciling the fallen human race to his creator and redeemer. Whether I believe or not, it is inherently authoritative. What this means is that when I come to scripture, I must throw away my biases, I must submit my will to the will of scripture. That makes the Bible authoritative. Most importantly, the ministers of the gospel are to be well informed to guide their members to read and understand the word of God and live by it. Once you are living by it, by the dictates of scripture, you are, you are recognizing the scripture as authoritative. So that is it for the first part, the inspiration and the issue of authority of the Bible. We will now launch into the second part, which is an introduction to textual criticism, translation, and hermeneutics. Thank you for joining us uh, in this uh, first uh, presentation. We hope you join us in the second part to complete this phase. Thank you very much. Share this uh, video with friends and um, like this page so we know you are following us and you like what you are doing. Subscribe if you have not subscribed and share the word with the world and you'll be blessed. Thank you. Sweet promises given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come, the danger is great. Sleep not as do others.